So common brain changes with aging, senior moments, meaning delayed recall. If you haven't had that yet, just wait. <laughs> the next stage is mild cognitive impairment, termed these days mild neurodegenerative disorder. So the fact is when patients are inducted into a protocol for Alzheimer's, nine out of 10 patients are rejected. They may be having mild cognitive impairment, they may be having the beginnings of a dementia, but they're not like Alzheimer patients. And the doctors who do those studies are very careful about the ones they select to have the most pure sample. So the two most common types of dementia are Alzheimer's and vascular. Both have cerebral amyloid angiopathy underlying them. Okay, so you've heard a lot about amyloid today. We don't fully know what it's doing, good and bad, but it's very important. So in the vascular kind of dementia, you have a microvascular ischemia, meaning the small blood vessels are not delivering oxygen and exchanging what they need to. You have what one neurologist said to a psychiatrist who brought his wife to me, don't worry dear, you're just having mini strokes. That's what doctors call lacunar infarcts when they're trying to be gentle. And what happens is you get more and more of these mini strokes and they begin to get together and your brain looks more and more like Swiss cheese. And then ultimately you get big strokes years down the line. Now in Alzheimer's you've got the amyloid and the patients also have the small blood vessel ischemia and then tau, tangles, come in. But about 25% of patients with Alzheimer's have the microvascular ischemia too. So you're gonna have several things coming together. So delayed retrieval treatment options. So a lot of doctors come to see me to get something to help them with delayed retrieval or even early mild cognitive impairment. Centrophenoxine is a drug that was developed in Europe by a Romanian chemist decades ago. There are hundreds of controlled studies in humans and animals on this. It makes your nerve cells start acting like much younger cells. It makes the nerve cell membrane work matter, much better. We'll talk about that. Selegiline is a drug that was invented by a Hungarian biochemist in 1960. He's 93, still doing great research. He's a chain-smoking, dumpling-eating Hungarian who just walks around Budapest with lousy air quality uh, for his exercise and still is doing great research. And he's been on selegiline for decades. Um, we'll talk about that. Selegiline delays brain aging in multiple ways. And there are thousands of research papers on it. We don't pay attention to what doctors do elsewhere in this, in this country. We don't look at that stuff. Rodiol Rosi, I'll talk about uh, when my wife and I, with Sakir Ramazanov, published our first paper on rhodiola in 2002. Research immediately skyrocketed, and now three different research groups, one at UCLA, have shown that rhodiola delays aging and keeps three different animal species much healthier. And we know a lot of the pathways involved, which are relevant to things that have been talked about today. Curcumin, or turmeric, we know in India, there's a lot less Alzheimer's, and it affects NK factor alpha and other things to reduce inflammation. Resveratrol has mechanisms that are also quite protective uh, of brain aging. Serifolin lowers homocysteine and helps patients with cognitive impairment do much better over time. So serifolin, especially with n cysteine added to it. Cardio exercise growing data. An interesting area to watch for is intermittent hypoxic training has dramatic effects and high intensity interval training really turns back the clock and makes cells look and act much long, younger. And we've talked about the other stuff, control of blood pressure, blood sugar lipids. Uh, Neurosilk or cognium is a silk protein that helps mild cognitive impairment and delayed retrieval. And phosphatidylserine, there's over 30 studies showing that over 40, if you take phosphatidylserine, your brain after about a month, if you dose it appropriately, begins working like someone 10 years younger, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, for mild cognitive impairment, a crucial thing that has been ignored in the US after 30 years of research done in Italy, a little bit of S-adenosylmethionine, sometimes called SAMI, 
with acetyl L-carnitine and acetylcysteine and B vitamins is extremely helpful. We'll talk more about that. The, the other thing I'll mention is Solostazole, a drug came out in the US in 96. It's around the world. It's cheap, it's generic. It can reverse mild cognitive impairment and the progression of vascular ischemia if people are caught early enough and there's a good bit of time to do it in. Picamelon is a Russian natural medicine that vastly improves blood flow in the brain and focus and also is helpful for anxiety. Uh, Biostrath is a Swiss herbal tonic that has over 33 controlled studies. And two of those studies were done in groups of 200 geriatric patients with major impairments of activities of daily living and cognition and physical abilities. And after three months, dramatic improvements compared to placebo, but it took three months. Um, Dinepazil has been tried for mild cognitive impairment, hoping it might prevent Alzheimer's, zero effect. But I bring that up because some doctors think that maybe, because it helps Alzheimer patients for some months, that maybe it should prevent Alzheimer's. Uh, but again, selegiline is very important at a number of stages of this. Dementia, curcumin may be important. It improves brain-derived neurotrophic factor, as does exercise. And we have data that we haven't published that intense yoga breathing also does that too, dramatically, much more than cardio exercise, actually. And in animal studies, increased BDNF protects against Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, selegiline. selegiline is prescribed to dogs in America for Alzheimer's. There have been 24 studies in Europe. It's a cheap drug, it's generic. Uh, it's not used by neurologists here. Saffron has been used for a thousand years in Persia and the Middle East for a number of things, including dementia. And I've taken patients who've stopped responding to Dinepazil, stopped responding to Namenda, couldn't button their shirts, and on saffron are dramatically better. And we need to look at why this is, and I know the group in Iran that has done the best studies on this, because they're looking at the old treatments to see how they're working. It's a great antioxidant in the brain, and it pulls amyloid out of the brain, too. Um, it turns out in Alzheimer's, combining SAMI with acetyl L-carnitine and acetylcysteine and B vitamins helps early and late stage Alzheimer's and even helps Aricept work better. Because Aricept tends to stop working much after about six to 12 months. Uh, Celestazole is really important. Uh, and I'm gonna show some individual slides on that. Uh, and it can be done with Alzheimer's, with microvascular disease, or just in the patients with microvascular disease. So microvascular ischemia or cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So mini strokes, lacunar infarcts. So this disease starts typically with bright spots close to the ventricles. There's a subtype that starts more in the subcortex first, and they kind of progress and extend over time. Uh, to the basal ganglia, the middle of the brain, the pons, the cerebellum, and you get over time bigger and bigger infarcts. And typically you see patients go into two years of mild cognitive impairment and then often slip into a vascular dementia. And it correlates with trouble with heart and often trouble with circulation in other parts of the body which are often not obvious. And a lot of the patients have falls and complain of dizziness and when they see neurologists, they have no idea why it's happening. But in Japan and Taiwan and Korea, they began looking at this. And uh, let me just show you what this looks like. Okay, so you see uh, mild levels of periventricular bright spots. The ventricles are these little sacs of fluid in your brain that have numerous functions, one of which is protecting your brain from shock injury. Uh, you get a moderate level here of the hyperlucencies. Hyperlucencies is doctor jargon for bright spots. And then you have severe, where you've got a lot of inflammation going on in there. And so Slostazole came in in, the, in 1996 in the US for intermittent claudication. Who knows what intermittent claudication is? It's where an old guy walks and his lower legs hurt so much he has to sit down every block or two for a while before he can walk again. It's because of lousy circulation. And usually he's got heart disease. Well, he's usually got brain disease too. It affects men and women. 
And it's very well tolerated. You can't take it if you have congestive heart failure, but most everybody can tolerate it very well. Uh, it's a, a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor, and it's even better than aspirin in large-scale studies they've done in those nationalized health systems for reducing the risk of stroke. It has multiple mechanisms. One is it drains amyloid out of the brain. And in fact, what they've shown recently in Taiwan is they've been prescribing it so much in the last five years or so, they've dramatically reduced the rate of dementia. So we're talking about a major, cheap, well-tolerated public intervention. And there's confirmatory data on that from Korea, cohort of 66,000 patients. When you have a nationalized health system, even though these are funded by private insurance, you can do these kinds of studies really quickly. They've done 30 studies, most of which are totally unknown to neurologists in the US. This is, I think, amazing. OK, let's talk about some other things. So cholinergic agents. Your delayed retrieval has to do with um, problems with the cholinergic system, nutrients, herbs, melatonin, nootropics, a term coined in Belgium about 1960 for the first drug that helped learning. And then there's neurofeedback, brain stimulation techniques, and mind-body practices. And remember, stroke and traumatic brain injury increase your risk of dementia. OK, because of time. Centrophenoxine is amazing medicine. It has, it's still being researched. It looks like it also, in an animal model of Alzheimer's, prevents things from forming that form to produce Parkinson's. Uh, so it's not just relevant to Alzheimer's. Very few side effects, well tolerated. Uh, this is the first study showing patients with uh, kind of mild cognitive impairment improved on SAMI and uh, acetyl L-carnitine and cysteine. It's a large study. This is the study of early stage Alzheimer's. And this is a study of late stage Alzheimer's showing how effective the SAMI was with the other nutrients. Picamelon is this Russian medicine. It's a condensation of GABA and niacin and has dramatic effects on the brain. In Russia, it's most often been used for toxic or organic brain syndromes, which follow from drinking a lot of vodka. <laughs> but it does a lot of things, and it protects damage from hypoxia to the brain. Uh, Biostrath I talked about already. Uh, you see the yellow plant in the left-hand side of the picture. That's Rhodiola rosea. This is on the border with Mongolia. I'm with a mountain guide and a famous Russian scientist who became a great friend. And he studied it for the Russian space program. It makes every part of your autonomic system work better. And the reason the things that Scott Carney was talking about work and the things that the horse therapy helps are working through those parts of the autonomic nervous system. And the only pill that helps those things work better is rhodiola rosea. And the Russians have used it for years, not only in their cosmonauts and its secret research. You will go to the gulag for revealing this in the, in the former Soviet Union. And it's used for their Olympic athletes and their special forces. This is a formula. They found several herbs help the rhodiola work better. Siberian ginseng and schizandra, which is what the Chinese emperors used to have special plots. And if you ventured near the plot and you weren't the gardener, you were dead. Uh, it helps racehorses do better, actually. Uh, anyway, ADAPT has had multiple studies. My wife and I have written a lot about this. Uh, but saffron looks like it's good for Alzheimer's. I think it needs to be looked at for earlier stages. It's also good for premenstrual dysphoric disorder and depression as well. And even though it acts on the serotonin system, it does not cause sexual dysfunction. It helps sexual function. And it reduces overeating of carbs. And there's a particular component in it that does that. Um, a good bit of data. Oh, you, you guys want to reduce carb intake? Uh, so in the last few minutes. Something that happens with a lot of Alzheimer patients is agitation, aggression, and they don't tolerate things like Valium or Ambien or other stuff like that. And lemon balm can be amazingly helpful without causing any problems. And also sage is another thing, as well as uh, some other herbs I don't have time to talk about. Depernil, thousands of studies, 
We can talk more about it if you like later. Oh, it helps sexual functioning. Wherever your sexual functioning is, it enhances it. And in the female animals, they never get breast cancer again after they're on it in six different species. No need to remind me. I'm fully aware that I've forgotten completely about you. <laughs> okay. So I know that was a whirlwind tour. There's a lot of other stuff we use. Uh, our website, and when I say our website, my wife, who's a Harvard-trained psychiatrist, I'm a Columbia-trained and Cornell-trained psychiatrist, uh, do a lot of work together. So our breath book has been translated into multiple languages. We'll do that. The breathing also enhances all components of the autonomic nervous system. And the core breathing I teach was described in a Chinese Buddhist text 3,000 years ago as the breathing for longevity. Uh, and we have a bunch of other things, including non-drug treatments for ADHD. And uh, mm, let's see. OK. Uh, I have some more slides, but I think. Dr. Yeah. yeah, the workshop tomorrow. So um, I've taken breathing techniques from several traditions. And with also not only experiencing them, but studying them with different labs around the world, we put together things that have a dramatic impact in a short time. Because people won't do that kind of stuff for more than about 15 or 20 minutes a day. And so I'm going to give a small exposure. We do not only research on this with several different labs. Uh, for example, Chris Streeter in Boston, who's done studies on yoga and brain MRS spectroscopy. Uh, but we do a lot of charitable work. Women who've been trafficked, genocide survivors in Africa, we're heavily involved in South Sudan, Rwanda, and we're working with uh, Bangladeshi Rohingya, well, Rohingya children. There are 300,000 kids with severe PTSD from Myanmar in Bangladesh, and we're doing online training, but I'll be going over there when the monsoon is done. So I will do the kind of breathing practice. We're working in New York City public schools. We have a whole community, upstate Rust Belt community, with a lot of opioid overdoses, with the help of the Commissioner of Mental Health, we're bringing that into an area. So this is something that everybody can benefit from uh, in every way. Thank you for mentioning that, Glenda.